I'm a sheriff's deputy in Bull's Heart, Texas. By Rev Black Rage. I work in a place called Bull's Heart, Texas. I'm a sheriff's deputy. Sort of. Technically, I'm a federal agent. No, I haven't been to Portland recently. Nevertheless, I'm supposed to protect and serve the people of Bull's Heart. Keep a lid on things. Keep the calm. But quite honestly, Jesus fuck, I hate this town. I mean, sure, the people are nice in their own odd way. But they recognize I have a rough job, mostly due to the nature of citizenry itself. They know that. They respect that. It doesn't stop them from getting rowdy. It doesn't stop them from going after each other and creating situations I gotta put my damn fool self in the middle of. It doesn't stop the collection of scars on my body from getting bigger doesn't stop the nightmares either. But they seem to appreciate the fact that this job is an ass kicker, which is nice, I suppose. If I was the milkman or ran a gas station or some shit, I might not hate this town as much. But then again, if I hadn't signed a 40 year contract with threat of life in a federal pen, if I broke said contract, I'd probably have hung it up and pushed on down the road in peace. People in this town know they can't control their nature. Some got a handle on it better than others, but most know they're one stressful day away from a good blow up. That's where me and the sheriff's department come in. Sometimes it's a simple matter of sitting the body down and letting them vent out their frustrations. Sometimes it's so bad we have to call in the big feds. I hate doing that. Those boys and girls come in wide eyed, terrified, and heavily armed. Fear is a motherfucker, and when it has a Beowulf .50 cal loaded with concentrated depleted uranium tipped browns, it can be a real bloody son bitch. But the fact of the matter is that the citizens of Bull's Heart are better off in this town than they would be out in the world. At least so far as normal folks like you and me is concerned. Just because folks is different doesn't mean they're evil. But sometimes, evil is a relative concept. The people have a lot of respect for me. A normal guy, albeit with some technological assistance, thrown down with the nastiness of their nature when they get less than civil. Hell, they respect the other guys that do this job too. But I'm one of the few normal types to do it. So they give us just a pinch of extra respect. But it doesn't stop us from getting our asses handed to us and occasionally getting gored to death or ripped apart or eaten or drained of blood or I could go on, but you get the picture. I was hoping for a relaxed evening as I pulled my up-armored Dodge Charger Interceptor into the parking lot of the only place a fella could get decent food at this godforsaken hour. I was something of a regular when I was on shift. They knew me, knew when I liked to stop in and usually had a plate of food ready for me. A woman wearing a typical diner waitress uniform was standing out front having a smoke as I walked up to the door. She had worked the counter at Toothy Earl's as long as anyone could remember. She was a little longer in the tooth these days though. She carried a little more weight. Her voice was a little harsher. Her fur had a little more gray in it. Supposedly she had been quite the looker in her youth though. She turned her head towards me as I walked up to the front doors. Her big yellow eyes got a little wider as she flashed me a fanged riddle grin. Her ears tilted forward in my direction a little. Well, if it isn't the long arm of the law. She rested at me with a little purr in her voice. Like she always did. She leaned in, closed her eyes, and nuzzled her furry cheek against mine. She was one of my biggest fans. Ever since a bus got lost on the way to a furry convention in Houston, got off the highway and stopped at the diner. They had mobbed her, pawing at her, telling her they loved her costume, when she was cornered, she went into fight mode. She damn near went full feral on them. Alder Gale or not, she had claws and a few thousand years of hand-to-hand -hand combat experience. She had taken the right eye of a fat man in a My Little Pony t-shirt and cargo shorts by the time I could get through the crowd to her. I took some cuts myself, but it was understandable given the circumstances. I bear no ill will towards her. She, however, had felt awful about tearing out the dumbass's eye. But when she explained the situation to me, I was ready to arrest the little creep myself. He had been fondling her, thinking he was fondling a costume and refusing to back off. I mean, what the fuck? 
Even if she was in a costume, you don't still go touching people who don't want to be touched. Ellie didn't want to press charges, though. She felt that losing his depth perception was enough of a punishment, even though she'd done it in the heat of the moment and not in her rational mind. Hey, Ellie, I said, giving her a gentle pat on the back. Everything all right? Oh, quiet as the grave, huh? She said whilst taking drag off of a Virginia Slim. I got food waiting for you in there. Go eat. You're getting skinny. Yes, ma'am. I watched the scrawny strapper walking towards my table in my favorite corner of Toothy Girl's Eatery. He must have been new, because he was gripping both sides of my plate with strained white fingers. He was holding on to my steak and eggs like his life depended on it. And at Earl's? It did. You could always tell the new ones because they weren't used to their new environments. They're all anxious energy and fear. Speak to some of them too loud and they shit themselves. Literally. Strippers are what we call the various shitbags and death row inmates that get sent to our town to serve the people. Keep a sense of normalcy for the inhabitants trying to live something of a normal life. Maybe provide a meal every once in a while. Think of them as indentured servants without an attached value of life. They're dropped here and put to work for the rest of their sentences. In the old days, they used to wear striped prison uniforms. That's how the name took root. Even though they dress differently now. Keep the monsters with the monsters, the old chef had said. Let us sort each other out. He would finish with a diabolical laugh. He didn't refer to the people of his town as monsters in a denigrating way, of course. He was one. I don't mean that in a bad way, either. Sheriff Onrio was literally the physical manifestation of a demon whose particular wheelhouse was vengeance. He stood nine feet tall, had three legs, skin that resembled the strike here part of a matchbox, four-inch fangs, claws, the whole nine yards. A crown of green fire always burned above his bald head. Whether he was wearing his brown round campaign hat or not, green flames blazed out of his eye sockets as well. When he wore his silver rimmed aviators, he looked like an Iron Maiden album cover. He had the voice to match too. Shit was involuntarily terrifying. Part of being the physical manifestation of a vengeance demon, I suppose. Keep in mind I said, the physical manifestation of. He wasn't exactly the demon, or even a demon. It was some weird metaphysical nonsense that he tried to explain to me over beers once. Something about him growing stronger than the actual demon and killing its mind and breaking free. It didn't make sense to me, but not a lot about Bull's Heart Texas actually does. Hell of a boss, though. Tough but fair. The striper wordlessly placed the food down in front of me. The patches on his shirt said he was a child murderer. The three red stars at the bottom of the child murderer patch said he was a pedophile as well. I was utterly incapable of feeling pity for the terrified man. The food looked good, though, as it always did at Toothy Earl's, but something was missing. Hey, shitbag, I said in my best guard voice. Where's my coffee? The striper looked at me with all the hate a man could muster. He looked like he was about to vent some of his stress in my direction. A bad choice for any striper. When I heard something make a riotous racket back in the kitchen, like a hot spatula being thrown across a hot griddle, the strider popped up straight at the sound, wide-eyed terror on his face. His head turned towards the service window between the front of the diner and the kitchen in the back. The man acting as my waiter let out a nervous moan. He brought his hands up into a ball under his chin his eyes went wide. A few of the other regulars turned their heads our way, hoping for a show, I reckon. Earl ran a tight ship. He didn't like it when his customers came into his establishment plonked down their hard-earned money and got poor service in return. When the waitress or waiter was a regular citizen of the town, they might have gotten a talking to or an ass chewing, as they were good people more or less. In the case of stripers, the ass chewing could be more literal. Marcel! A voice called from the kitchen, sounding like it was bubbling through a drowned man's voice box. Did you remember our talk? What comes before food? The striper looked down, pressing his balled-up fist into his eyes. 
His response was a terrified murmur, tears streaming down his face at this point. This was a pretty typical reaction for most strippers who were new in town. I don't think I heard you, Marcel. The drowning man's voice floated out from the back again. D -d drink B before food, Marcel stammered out. That's right, the voice confirmed. Drink before food. Now don't leave the deputy waiting. He likes his coffee with a lot of cream and sugar. Because he has such a sweet disposition. Earl's voice had a note of playfulness to it, upon mentioning my general attitude towards the world. Well, as much as that voice could sound playful. The striper probably didn't pick up on that. He had to stick around for a while to pick up on these sorts of things, and most strippers didn't survive long enough. Thanks, Earl. I called out to the kitchen. A large three-fingered scaly hand about the size of a dinner plate reached out through the service window. A thumb and a massive claw extended upwards. No problem, deputy. Earl warbled back. A favorable review on Yelp would be appreciated. I got a snort out of a couple regulars sitting at the bar. It was an inside joke. I've been known to leave an occasional Yelp review. I don't know why people gave me shit for it. Quality service should be praised and bad service should be mentioned so as the establishment can get better. But for some reason which is beyond me, people like to give me a rash or a shit for it, and I don't see the humor in it, frankly. Fuck you, Earl, I said in as monotone as possible. The regulars at the bar let rip without right laughter. Charming as always, deputy. The drowning man's voice called back, cheerfully busting my balls. Earl had known me long enough that he knew that I meant nothing by it, or I wouldn't have made the joke. I could take Earl in a fight, with the proper equipment of course, but he had started life as a water deity for a tribe somewhere on the Nile River Delta. One of the gods folks prayed to, before they went out and fucked someone up. So fights he was involved with didn't tend to be fun affairs, so I generally try and keep it affable with him. I realized the striper was still standing next to my table. His hands were balled up at his sides. His eyes squeezed shut. He was muttering something, sounding like a prayer. Now a fella in his fearful condition might seem someone deserving of compassion. I'm here to say he's not. He has earned every bit of this. He has earned his torment. Now I know what you're saying. What if he was wrongly convicted of his crimes? What if it was a frame-up? What if he was a good guy caught in a bad situation? Allow me to hang a light on it for you. That shit happens in the real world. In this town? People know evil. Can sniff it out like a bloodhound. Hell, some of them helped write down the definition of the word. Now the government has tried to use us to disappear people. Before my time, or so I'm told. They found out that that shit doesn't fly real fast. The people of Bull's Heart aren't a tool for slaughtering suspected communists. Just folks tired of living in the dark and wanting to live around people they might have a thing or two in common with. Doesn't mean they can't still fuck shit up. So when I say the government found out real quick that that shit don't fly, they found out real hard. You ever heard of Herbert Gilroy Chalmers? No. Nobody has. He was president of the United States for about three months at some point in the early 1900s. No one's exactly sure which three months, though. Now, there's some speculation as to which town he pissed off. Might have been Bull's Heart or one of its sister townships or colonies. But for purposes of local pride, we say it's Bull's Heart. But anyway, dude tried to lay down the law on the town full of nightmares and myths. Now, it doesn't even exist in history books. You figure that shit out. We're actually on the 46th president and nobody knows it. Sorry, got off on a tangent there. Despite my hatred of my job, I can at least admit that the town has one hell of a fascinating history. Nature of it and all. The fearful striper looked dead set in finishing his prayer. I was more dead set in getting some caffeine. I wrapped my fingers on the table to get his attention. I raised my eyebrow at the dude, giving him a look that said, Chop, chop, motherfucker. The striper looked down at me. His eyes flicked to a steak knife sitting next to my untouched steak and eggs. I could see what he wanted to do. 
I was used to being viewed as a soft target by rambunctious strippers. I'm not. But when you stay me against some of the folks around here, it might just appear that way. Most of the normies living in this town looked like soft targets compared to everything else. They weren't either, though. Like most Texans who lived outside of the big cities, you had to be tough to get by. In Bull's Heart? Even more so. I placed my finger on the plastic handle of the steak knife. I met his eyes and slid the blade closer to him. I was damn near daring him at this point. How do you want your day to end? I asked him. You want to go back to the lockup, get a smooth in, wake up, and face tomorrow all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed? Or? I motioned with my head towards a couple of fellas at the bar arguing over who was going to win the Super Bowl this year, Dallas or Houston. This is Texas, after all. You want to be someone's dinner. The striper, Marcel, looked down at the knife. Then his eyes flicked back up at me and back down at the knife again. A fat bead of sweat rolled down the side of his face. He ran his tongue across his suddenly dry upper lip. As his eyes lost focus, I could tell he wanted to gut me. Old Bubba Ray over there is a vegetarian, but he don't mind taking a bite of a striper every now and again. I said, not taking my finger off of the knife. Now I see his blunt teeth. No man for ripping throats out. Man for meshing down grass and the occasional bug. Not for ripping and tearing. So he has to mash his meat before he can swallow it. Just big blunt teeth, pulping muscle and tissue down. Can you imagine what that feels like, Marcel? I leaned back in my chair, removing my hands from the table, putting them in my lap, presenting an easier target to him. I pulled his daughter out of a flipped over pickup truck that had the temerity to be on fire at the time. Got myself pretty cooked in the process. But she lived. Starting high school next year. Good kid. Old Bubba Ray has played something of a life debt to me. Now, of course I told him he didn't need to do that. Of course. But you know how daddies are with their kids. You save their babies' lives, they think you hung the moon up. Marshall's eyes darted over towards the large fellow with horns wearing the 5XL J.J. Watt jersey. Bubba's horns could put a longhorn's wreck to shame. They ended in nasty points that Bubba meticulously kept sharp. Not for intimidation, mind, but because he liked to look presentable. Bubba Ray was getting deep into his gridiron debate, and I could tell he was getting serious, too. He was banging his hoof on the floor, as he was punctuating individual points of merit. I could tell that Marcel was deep in the middle of an internal struggle. He was close to the breaking point. Problem for him is that I really like fucking with these guys. I leaned forward in my chair a little bit, doing my best to bore my eyes right through Marcel's. I straightened up my shoulders a little, stared up at Marcel from under my eyebrows and gave him a mocking grin. One of those that a crazy fellow in a movie might have when he's trying to fuck with a heroic protagonist. Marcel's peepers flicked to the serrated meat cutter. I placed my elbows back on the table. We know you ain't got the sight for it, boy. I said, shoving every bit of high school bully into my voice I could muster. Calling him boy was a bit of a mock, since he must have been at least ten years my senior. That's why you went for kids, wasn't it? Marcel's eyes bored into the back of mine, anger darkening those baby blues of his. That was it. The striper was nothing but a rat fuck looking to feel tough. You know what fucks with these guys the most? When you just lay their shit right out in front of them. Make them confront it. Poke through any different justification notions they may have built up. A full-grown woman would have rocked your shit, Marcel. A full-grown man would have turned your narrow ass into a doorstop. But kids? They can't fight back, can they? Too small. Smaller than you, even. You ain't never been a tough guy. Or even a durable guy. You probably grew up getting called a pussy every day of your life. Might have been your daddy, or it might have been whatever no good piece of last call bar trash your whore mama drug home that night. Might have been your gym coach. Might have been that guy who bashed your head into a locker so as to make the prom queen girlfriend moister than an oyster. The who might not matter, but it was someone, wasn't it? Some motherfucker you've been trying in vain your whole life to prove wrong. 
You probably spent the halcyon days of your youth drowning kittens and fucking the sleeve of your favorite jacket, never once making a friend. Because nobody wants to hang out with a kid who smells like old gym socks and jizz. And you weren't even getting a second glance from the girls who you liked. No, not at all. Because you could never work up the courage to talk to them. Could you? So now you're quite the deranged little fuck who went too far and got caught. You got dropped in a spot where you were treated with the same regard as those kids you messed up, and it scares the shit out of you, don't it? Marcel screwed up his mouth in a sourpuss tight-lipped scowl. He raised his hands up and laid his palms on his cheeks. He knew damn well he couldn't even respond. He knew that much of the score. He'd been cast out by polite society and was now forced to walk among monsters who didn't seem to hold him in high regard either. I could see the anger in his eyes. I didn't know if anything I said rung true or was just insulting enough to get his goat. I didn't care either. Now, I started again. We both know you ain't gonna do nothing because if you did, well, you know what's gonna happen to you and you may not like your life right now, but you damn sure don't want to lose it. So go get me my coffee, shit heel. I spat out that last phrase with as much bile and venom as I could vocally muster. Marcel was shaking at this point. I got the feeling that half the reason he was pressing his hand to his face was just so he could keep his mouth shut. I could see he was breathing hard and for a moment I thought he might have had the gumption to play for the flatware. Sometimes they do. Getting dropped into Bull's heart knowing there wasn't really an escape and knowing that you were most likely going to die with the knowledge of what your insides look like. Well, it can be stressful. Even for a sick fuck like Marcel. But eventually he only nodded. He did in fact know the score. He stared down at me for a moment, eyes cherry red from crying. He was probably trying to figure me out. Why was the normal looking dude so friendly with all these things that were so mean to him? Shouldn't there be some form of human solidarity? That was an easy answer. They were people. He was not. Fuck him. Now I'm sure he wanted to bluster and rage at me, I'm sure he still wanted to snatch up that knife and cut a new mouth in my face. I'm sure I'd gotten myself onto some mental list he was building in that deranged little skull of his. I'm sure in his mind he's killed me at least five or six times in a multitude of exotic and intriguing ways. But what he actually did in reality was finally turn around and get me my goddamn coffee. I noticed when he walked behind the counter towards the coffee machine, Bubba Ray and another bit of local caller named Murray. The fellow who Bubba Ray had been arguing with both turned an eye towards him. I noticed that the terrified striper seemed to be doing his best not to look at them. Trying to pretend the two nightmares hadn't just focused a small bit of their attention to him. I understood why. Bubba Ray could be a scary sight on his own, but Murray could be a real perplexing son of a bitch just to look at. I don't mean that in a mean way, of course, but facts is facts. When a man walks into her diner and plops his head down on the counter, well, that goes all against notions of nature. And it can be a little disconcerting at first. Plus, it's hard to talk to Murray. I never know where to look. Do I stare at the half-rotten coconut sitting in his hands, or do I just look where his head should be? Plus, the fact that Murray was a tiny bit self-conscious about it didn't help. I mean, he had no reason to be. Couldn't help how the force of metaphysics and great beyond had shaped him. I'll spin you up, though. You ever run across Murray or a, f or a fellow with a similar condition, just talk to the head. If he gets bored and just starts tossing it hand to hand, just talk to the chest. Both seem to be acceptable. The striper made a point not looking at either man and concentrated on the task at hand. He finally brought the cup back to me and set it down wordlessly in front of me. The tremor in his hands only made him spill a little bit. Without a word, he turned to walk away, but I heard a long, drawn-out hiss over my shoulder. It sounded like a mama mountain lion hissing at a wayward cub. The striper froze in his tracks, his body going tense. Marcel. Ellie asked with a bit of an annoyed hostility in her voice. Apparently, she had finished up her smoke break. Did you ask the deputy if he wanted anything else while you were at the table? He looked over at the old waitress and sheepishly shook his head. 
No, he said quietly. His voice marched right up to the line of being dismissive, or as close as it was safe to do so. He probably wasn't as scared of Ellie as he was Toothy Earl, Bubba Ray, or Murray. She may look like a mountain lion, but she was friendly as all hell. It was her nature. So I could see where he might get a little more comfortable with her. Which, if you know the four of them, that's just about the wrong attitude to take. Now, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't get in line to tussle with any of them. Swamp monsters, minotaurs, headless horse people are all dangerous in their own right. But Ellie, retired though she might be, probably had them all on experience alone. I once found a book in the Sheriff's Office Tactical Research Library. It was the transcription of an accountant of a brouhaha Ellie had found herself in. Way back in 1300 or some odd year. Somewhere in Proto-Germany. I don't remember which part. The condensed story is that... 200 warriors, the best warriors from three different principalities at that, went to push her out of a forest she was calling home at the time. Only one of them came back. He was half out of his gourd and hauling a cart full of severed heads. A very elegant way of saying, leave me the fuck alone. I briefly wondered if Ellie was going to take his head off. I would asked her about the battle in the Proto-German forest. She told me that she didn't really remember much about it. The 1300s were apparently a very wild time in her life and she could hardly be expected to remember every little scrap she had been in. Which is fair, I guess. The striper looked up at her. Now, I may have him a little worked up from earlier. The stress might be getting to him. Or he might have just plain old felt like standing up for himself. No, I didn't. He said a little louder, damn near glaring at Ellie. This isn't my job. This isn't right. I shouldn't be here, surrounded by you. Things. And this. Motion towards me. Traitor. None of you are real. I noticed his voice was rising. It was also starting to crack, sounding like his balls were mid-drop. Racism aside, I can't say that a piece of degenerate detritus like Marcel implying that I was some sort of race traitor had much of an effect on me. Nevertheless, I eased my hand towards the handle of a large caliber smoke wagon sitting on my duty belt. Not to defend him, of course. I might have been okay with him taking a swing at me, but I didn't like anyone getting lippy with Miss Ellie. As Marcel got defiant, Bubba Ray and Murray dropped their conversation like a sack of bricks. Almost in sync, they spun around on their stools and leaned back against the counter. The counter creaking as Bubba Ray leaned his considerable bulk against it. Murray picked his head up off the bar and placed it on his lap. He elbowed Bubba in the ribs, pointing at the brewing altercation, Bubba slapping his elbow away. I'm watching it too, dumbass. Bubba Ray snorted at his pal. Now hush up. Ellie's pupils got thin and she stared back at the wayward striper. I noticed that her hands had began to flex, her claws slowly sliding out of her fingertips as she worked her fingers. Her posture tensed up like she was about to pounce. I noticed her ears were laid back against her skull. In the background, I noticed Toothy's snout sliding out of the kitchen window, followed by the rest of Toothy Earl's head. It reminded me of a crocodile gliding through the water, his reptilian eyes taking in the situation his forked tongue sliding out of his mouth, slapping at his lizard-like lips. He looked like he was invested in the situation taking place in his dining room. Listen here, you cheeky little gobshite, she said, her voice become more of a low rumble at this point. Your people cast you out. You were sentenced to death. You are dead as far as the note is concerned. She was interrupted by my radio squawking to life. A dispatcher called my name out of the ether, wanting to know my location. Marcel jumped and a little bit of tension bled out of the room. Son of a bitch. I grumbled as I reached down to the handset sitting on my shoulder. Yeah, Jen, I'm at Earl's. I replied back to the radio. I realized I hadn't eaten yet. If they were calling me, I might not have a chance to eat tonight. So I shoved the fork full of eggs into my mouth. I got deputies Gruck and Dallywall responding to a 1016 over at Miller's place. Can I route you over to back them up? I said, getting between the Millers in the middle of a marital dispute was about the last thing I wanted to do. 
but I doubted that Grook and Dollywall wanted to be there either. Before I could say anything, Ellie pounced forward. Marcel let out a high-pitched squeak and fell back onto his narrow ass. He started screaming and scrabbling back as fast as he could. He kicked chairs away with a clatter. Tables fell over. Little bundles of silverware wrapped in napkins were propelled across the room. I could imagine that his life was flushing before his eyes. Ellie came to a stop in front of me. She reached down and picked up my cup of joe. She spared a glare towards the and striper, one that bespoke of a lot of matronly anger. She spun on her heel and moved with a purpose towards the coffee machine and the stack of styrofoam to go cups next to it. Murray and Bubba fell over each other laughing. Murray thumped Bubba Ray's back as he howled with laughter. Bubba Ray himself was in the middle of hitching slash snorting laughs himself, sounding like a bull that was charging a matador. But he just thought of a really funny joke another bull had told him back at the bullpen. Toothy Earl was glaring at the destruction of his dining room, or as much as a reptilian swamp monster was capable of glaring. I knew that Marcel was going to have a rough night ahead of him. If he even survived the night was a different question altogether. As funny as the spectacle of it all was, he was a striper, and he had just made a big old whopper of a mistake. My thumb shifted to the PTT button on my headset as soon as the ruckus died down some. Yep, show me en route.